I want to start off by welcoming you to our Queen's Speaking of Health free lecture series. Tonight's lecture is called The Ketogenic Diet Fact or Fad. And now it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce you to our speaker for this evening, Dr. Robert Eager. Let's give him a warm round of applause. He is a bariatrician with the Queen's Comprehensive Weight Management Program. And a little background about him. He was born in Longview, Texas. He went to University of North Texas and got his bachelor's of, you guessed it, fine arts. <laughs> he got his medical degree from the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston. He did his internal medicine residency at the University of Hawaii. Before coming to Queens, he was with Virginia Mason Federal Way Medical Center in the state of Washington for more than four years. He also worked in medical editing and publishing services in, you guessed it, Ireland. <laughs> and he has won several awards, including the Fisher Award for Excellence in Neurology and Neurology Research. He has published works as varied as lung cancer vaccines and clinical development directions in oncolytic viral therapy and aggressive juvenile fibromatosis of the paranasal sinuses. Wow. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Eager. All right. Welcome. So uh, tonight we're going to talk about ketogenic diets. You know, I kind of wanted it to be called fact and fad, but uh, fact or fad is fine. Um, so just a quick overview. So we're going to talk about what a, what a ketogenic diet is, whether, you know, risk and benefits of following a keto diet and um, who, what, what kind of person should consider doing a ketogenic diet. Um, if you look online, it's, they say everybody should try a ketogenic diet. That is not true. Um, what you can expect for your uh, initial weight loss and some tips on how to maintain a health, healthy weight. So ketogenic diets, um, they vary. So it, you'll, you'll look and you'll see different percentages on how many, um, what's recommended for your daily allotment of protein and daily allotment of fats. But what's consistent is the allotment of carbohydrates. Um, so carbohydrates, it is um, a term um, that includes things like starches, sugars, and even dietary fiber. Um, so, um, when you're trying to achieve ketosis, you are tar trying to target a diet that has less than 50 grams of total carbohydrate in your diet. That's a hard thing to do. When you, when you think about the uh, FDA recommended day allowance is more like 55 to 60% of your diet should be carbohydrate, trying to get down to 5%. Um, can be can be somewhat challenging, but we got some tips to help you figure that out. Um, the ketogenic diet. So the the term comes from a chemical called a ketone, and ketones are a byproduct of fat metabolism. So the re the reason that that ketogenic diets can kind of accelerate weight loss is because you're utilizing fat storage as a secondary fuel. So carbohydrates in many cases break down to a, a sugar called glucose, and glucose is our primary fuel. That's what our body wants. Our brain uses it, our heart uses it, our basal metabolic rate is all based on our body burning sugar, glucose. Ketogenic diets reduce the amount of sugar intake to a point where your body has to scramble for a secondary fuel. So as if we ran out of gasoline and we all had to use ethanol. The the secondary fuel are fats. Fats broken down, turned into ketones, and our brain and our heart and everything can use ketones as a secondary fuel. So not only are you restricting calorie, which will allow you to lose weight, you're also mobilizing fat storage. Now, you, you know, is that unique to 
ketogenic diets? The, the truth is, is no. If you, if you restrict calories in general, you'll mobilize fat. But um, when, what we find with ketogenic diets is, is that actually the, the, the amount is greater and um, that's where we get that accelerated weight loss. So what you know what what do I what is the um, what constitutes a ketogenic diet and what is in, what's the content? So how do I how do you get your diet so high in fat and protein and reduce starches? Well, you're going to be eating a lot of animal protein, meat, fish, chicken, pork, beef. Um, Poultry, so eggs, eggs, and egg with yolk in is a good source. The vegetables in these diets are all the non-starchy vegetables. And so you think, okay, what is a non-starchy vegetable? Easy, it's easier to think of the starchy vegetables because there's only a handful. So, you, you know, your starchy vegetables, your peas, corn, potato, all the tubers, and things like butternut squash, those kind of things. Everything else can be considered non-starchy and you can use those in ketogenic diets. Um, dairy, when you're looking at dairy, in, in general, you know, as a physician, we recommend low-fat dairy. In ketogenic diets, you're not substituting low-fat um, um, dairy. You're, you're looking for whole milk, full-fat options. Um, another good source, so say you're, say you're vegan and you don't want to uh, try and do a ketogenic diet with dairy and meat, um, you're, you're in trouble, but your, your diet's going to be pretty, pretty strict. You're, you're looking more at the, um, the nuts, seeds, and things like avocado, high fat vegetables, um, Things that you can kind of indulge in, but you, you have to be pretty careful about um, um, quantity. So when you say when you see some, what you need to think of is like, okay, this means now I got to start doing math and I start logging what I'm eating and using a calorie counting app to or some type of tool to count calories and count your ma macronutrients because otherwise you're just going to get lost. But sums, so those those are things that um, have maybe a little bit more dietary carbohydrate, but it isn't so much that it would pre prevent you from going into ketosis. Your roots, your fruits, alcohol that is like grain alcohol, um, dry wines, um, cocktails that don't have sugar in them, those are okay one to two times a week. If you're drinking more than that, um, then you're probably not really interested in losing weight anyway. Um, the, um, but, you know, with, the, with these list of sum, really for my patients, I always recommend that you don't do the sums until you've been in, until you're in ketosis. You've, you've been on this strict diet for two weeks. So you try and really make sure that you get your body into ketosis before you add some of these, like, higher sugar foods. Um, things you just can't have. Um, Pretty much, you can't participate in any holiday. <laughs> you're going, yeah, you're going to. Um, so anything that has a, any liquid that has sugar in it, juice. So all the things we think are healthy: orange juice, grapefruit juice. You can't have it. Um, milk, chocolate, cakes, any kind of pastry, any kind of sweet, um, sugar that is contained in any fashion. So this diet requires a lot of label reading and you will find sugar in things that you didn't expect to, to, to find it. Um, if you don't read labels, these diets won't work. Um, and no beer. You can't drink beer. So what does that look? This is a ketogenic plate. There's, there's some obvious omissions here. No rice, no bread, no pasta. You're, you're looking primarily at fiber, protein, and fat. And I think that's one of the big challenges of these diets is, is that it is not traditional balanced eating. 
Um, and it takes some practice to do it. The ketogenic diet puts your body into ketosis by basically, and this is just your, your um, a diagram kind of explaining why, why you need um, why you need to mobilize the fat. The fat keeps our um, the fat or the byproducts ketones keep our body operating. There are some benefits. Um, and I, you know, efforts, uh, it's not effortless weight loss, but the requirement for physical activity is, is much lower to achieve weight loss with this type of diet. So for patients who have orthopedic problems, can't get out there and run and jog, um, sometimes this is a good diet to follow to help accelerate the weight loss and take off some of that weight burden without requiring a lot of exercise. Patients um, who have, um, it, and this is very, very, based on very, very small trials, not a lot of evidence, but um, there is some evidence that uh, ketosis can improve heart disease. Um, and lower things like triglycerides, total cholesterol, and improve your HDL profile. That's primarily with plant-based fats. So if you're doing a lot of saturated fats, it's not necessarily the case. That's the one caveat. I also work at um, the Caillou Orange program, and they do <laughs> so they they do a complete vegan diet, and which is com completely opposite of this. Um, but um, it's, it's an interesting debate. Um, type 2 diabetes. So type 2 diabetes, it, it can, these types of diet do improve insulin sensitivity. They decrease insulin production, um, which in turn um, shifts your body towards lip, uh, lipolysis, which is fat breakdown, rather than fat storage. Um, but be careful if you're a type 2 diabetic um, because patients are on a spectrum with that illness. Some people are taking high doses of insulin. Some people are taking medications that can cause low blood sugar. And if you're taking those medications and you go on a um, ketogenic diet, you're putting yourself at risk for actual um, low blood sugars rather than high blood sugars. And low blood sugars can be just as dangerous as high blood sugars. So if you have type 2 diabetes and you read on the internet that this is going to fix your type 2 diabetes, you need to talk to your doctor first. Make sure that you're not on one of these medications. Make sure that you're, you're having somebody watch um, your kidney function and uh, your, insul your insulin regimen um, if you're going to try this. Um, but my patients who go on these diets who have um, lifestyle managed type 2 diabetes, meaning they're not taking a lot of medicine yet, they're, they're man managing their blood sugars with their eating, a lot of times their blood sugars go to normal on these diets. I mean, it, it, there is a, a, a real profound response. I usually end up having to stop their oral medications because they don't need them. Um, Metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is kind of like a combination of prediabetes and um, um, com combined with uh, central obesity, high cholesterol, um, and a lot of these things. These, you know, this would be a good a good diet for people in that situation. There's been some studies that cancer um, can be affected by ketogenic diets um, just because of the lack of carbohydrates. So. Um, cancers are a high, high metabolic tissue, meaning they require a lot of energy. They're growing, it's a, a tissue that's growing out of control, so it needs energy. And the, cal the calorie restriction and lack of carbohydrate is, the th is in theory why um, they think it has effects on tumor growth. Alzheimer's disease, um, there's been some very weak studies showing that it can help um, not pre 
stop the progression of um, Alzheimer's, but reduce the symptoms. Um, same thing goes with uh, Parkinson's disease. You know, one of the one of the first indications for ketogenic diet was, was uh, seizure disorder, so epilepsy, and it is it has been shown with strong evidence that it does help reduce seizures. So if you are a patient who has seizures, seizure disorder and you're trying to work on your weight, this is a good option. There's the, there were, I found one small study that showed that acne, acne improves on these diets, so for all those teenagers out there. Okay, so this, this is a problematic thing because getting into ketosis, there's a price to pay. Um, your body is transitioning from its base, baseline metabolism into this alternative metabolism. And for many people who do these diets, you actually feel that. So I would, the, the time frame varies in, by individual. The average duration is about two to three days that you're feeling like this. And in fact, my patients who choose to do these protocols, I have them start it on a Friday so that they don't show up to work and bite somebody's head off. It, <laughs> It is, you feel, and I've, I've done this just to see, you feel like you're catching the cold or the flu. So your energy's low, you might have upset stomach, um, lightheadedness, headaches, those are common, um, irritability, and um, the other thing that's mentioned here is constipation. And constipation can be kind of a chronic problem on ketogenic diets because it's a high protein, low fiber diet. And so, um, you, you know, that, that can be something you have to manage the entire time you're on one of these, these diets. Um, so other things that can be affected, um, it can, in some people, it can have a negative impact on certain people who have genetic predisposition to cholesterol issues. Can have it can have a negative impact on your cholesterol. Um, it is for two reasons can affect your kidney function because in many of these you are increasing the total amount of protein you normally would eat and the total amount of fat. So now your kidneys have to deal with a bunch of ketones that are filtering through and an increased protein load. So, you know, people who are struggling with kidney problems, it's probably not a good option for you. Um, because it can, um, depending on what type of, of proteins you're eating and what types of fats you're eating, um, you can have more frequent gout flares. So my patients who have history of high uric acid or gout, even if they've had it five years ago, I have them go back on their preventive medication because the last thing you want to do is lose weight and be stuck in bed. Um, you can lose muscle. Any weight loss can cause muscle wasting. And losing muscle can negatively impact your metabolism, meaning how many calories your body needs to get through the day. You don't want to damage your metabolism dieting, because if you do that, you are stuck with a smaller budget when you injured and that means you're at a higher risk of regaining that weight because you're working with less calories so I encourage my patients who do these diets even though I know and I know two slides ago it said effortless weight loss you still have to put the effort in if you don't use your your muscles while you're losing weight they um, atrophy they get weaker um, so Who should consider these kind of diets? Um, well, people who want to lose weight because because it works. It really does. Um, if you struggle with appetite control, these are good diets. Um, once you get into ketosis, one of the most common phenomena that people report that in my clinic is that they feel full and they don't crave sugar. If you're trying to break that addictive cycle to sugar, these are these are good diets to follow. 
as long as you can make it into ketosis. Um, and you know, if you're if you're one of those people with prediabetes, impaired fasting blood sugar, you're on the border, and you're trying to prevent diabetes. These diets can help um, slow the onset and reduce your blood sugars. So patients, you know, are are are, are people who are thinking ketogenic diets are are the way to go. Well, you need to you need to think about your personal health uh, conditions because you can cause some serious problems. Um, ketogenic diets put strain on both the liver and the kidney. And if you have pre-existing liver and kidney disease, um, I don't have patients start ketogenic diets. It's, it is, weight loss is not worth damaging one of your organs. There are other ways to lose weight that would probably be safer. People, you know, the, the thing about competitive athletes, it, you actually, if you're doing it right, you can be in ketosis and be an athlete. Um, in fact, there's a study that came out uh, about 10 years ago that showed you are, um, it doesn't affect your exercise tolerance, and particularly aerobic exercise. Um, but I, you know, when people do ketogenic diets and trying to do anaerobic exercise, which would be like heavy weight lifting or um, you know, sp sprinting while they're swimming, um, you, you can hit the wall pretty quick because you, your body doesn't have the same storage. It doesn't have the glucose glycogen storage in as, as much as it would in your normal state. Um, if you are, if you know that you are the type of person who is going to cheat on a diet, don't bother <laughs> because you you basically will keep yourself in the cycle of the flu-like state. So you're trying to get into ketosis, but then you're like, well, maybe I'll have a piece of pie and a cookie tonight. You're out of ketosis. You try to get back in there. So it's like weeks of headache and, and leg cramps and fatigue and you're not being nice to your kids and just if, if, if you think it's like, well, I'm going to have a little this, that, here and there, um, just, just do a low-carb diet and be happy. So what, what you should expect. Um, can you sustain this? So that's... That's a real issue in my clinic is this works really great for about three months and then people kind of get tired of it. And um, there are some, I, I, there are the outliers. I have patients who've been doing this for years and we monitor them and make sure everything's safe. And, um, you know, they do great. I've had patients lose, as you know, um, I've, couple come to mind or they've lost over a hundred pounds doing this type of dieting um, but for the that though that's the exception which proves the rule the rule is it's going to be hard to do these diets long term most people fatigue at about three or four months and um, it is pro probably because some of the initial benefits that you're getting um, start to taper. So the weight loss kind of slows down over time. Um, the um, natural progression of friends bringing over different kinds of foods and, you know, all people loving you to death um, kind of get in the way of this um, sustaining long term. Um, it is being in being on a ketogenic diet is very similar to being a vegan. You are that person at the table who's like, ordering special food and asking for accommodations and all that. And so, so you know, many people kind of get tired of doing that. Um, the, the issue is when you hit that point where you decide, I, I'm, I'm done, I can't keep doing this. If, if you go back to your diet that you were doing before, it, all of the weight comes back and more within months. It is, it is so rapid that it's, it's, frustrating for people. Um, so you really, if you're going to enter into the, doing one of these diets, you need, you need to start thinking about your exit strategy 
how am I going to get myself off of this diet and not regain the weight? Just because that's just, you work so hard, you sacrifice so much, you need, you know, give yourself the best chance to keep the weight off. The, you know, where it says 33 to 66% patients regain the weight, it's really probably higher than 66%. Um, so when you terminate in this type of eating, what I would recommend is um, have your metabolism measured somewhere. Um, go to a center where they can actually tell you this is how many this is what this is what your metabolism is this is how many calories you need to eat and um, you know in combination with the realistic amount of exercise um, so that you can slowly gradually reintroduce complex carbohydrates back into your diet I, I said complex not not simple carbohydrates um, it is um, if you if you add simple sugars back, you're just going to regain the weight. So um, this is the most annoying slide I have. It's the last one because it's it just is, it's how do you how do you these are not just tips. This is actually what what works. It's so simple and it's so hard to do. So just this this is scientifically proven. Weigh yourself once a week. If you notice you're weight gaining weight, do something about it. What works is food logging. People hate food logging. It really works. It brings forward in your consciousness what you're doing. I tell my patients all the time, and it's the truth. Your brain is so forgiving when it comes to food. You will eat junk all day long, have a salad at lunch, and say, oh, that's pretty good today. <laughs> I had a salad. And um, it's amazing when people write things down, they write down what they're doing. Um, you will see what you're doing. You're not dumb. You'll figure it out. And you have, a, you have a, at least a tool to help you make some change. And you might look at it and say, like, yeah, I'm happy with that. I'm going to keep going. But... If you're trying to maintain, it, it, is, it is the weakest part of diet, dieting is weight maintenance. Um, I think for, for lifestyle intervention, weight loss, which is th things like this, the, the, the failure rate at two years, meaning I've regained the weight at two years, is clo close to or above 90%. So the weight maintenance is the hardest part. These things really work. It's really simple. Try to move your body in some fashion that outside of your daily act, normal daily activity, exercise three hours a week. Walking is exercise. But, you know, three hours a week, when you divvy it up, it's a little less than half an hour a day. It seems reasonable. It's, it's, it's hard to do. Um, and then, you know, if you're struggling, you're doing everything right, you came, you came off your ketogenic diet, or you stayed on your ketogenic diet, and the weight's coming back, and you don't know why, have your metabolism evaluated. I mean, there's, that's, that's where, you know, your clinician can come in and help. Um, there are places here in Hawaii that do these resting metabolic rate tests. We do, that, we do them at Queens, and, it, and it's helpful. It takes away the black box you have a target to shoot for. And it'll help you, in the long run, learn how to eat for the rest of your life. Because if you can't stay on these kind of diets, you gotta figure out what you're gonna do. Um, because if you keep doing what you were doing before you were on this diet, well, every, everything reverts. Um, you know, I tell my patients that whatever you're doing to get to that weight is what you have to do. If you deviate from that, the weight, your weight's going to change. And um, there is no, I did a 90-day program, and now I'm going back to whatever else I was doing before. Because if you do that, the weight will come back. Um, there is no, the, the idea behind these like 30 and 60-day challenge things is, is that you will, it will give you enough practice that you will actually apply some of this stuff long-term for the rest of your life. 
Um, and that doesn't always happen because some, you know, it's just human nature. You're like, I did it, and then, and then that's it. Um, but you know, think about that if you're thinking about ketogenic diets. Um, either think, okay, can I do this for the rest of my life? Because whatever weight I get off, that's what I got to keep doing. Or do I have an ex exit strategy out of this? Because if you don't, it's just going to come back. Um, so that's it for my slide presentation. Um, I have, I have like a, a quick five question quiz on ketogenic diets. I don't know if you guys want to do this or not. Um, no, I don't care. We're going to do it. So, so these are things that I've that I've uh, that I read online, and and I just want to see if you guys. And this, it's all true or false. You don't have to be quiet, shy about it. Just shout it out. I'll figure out what you know what the gestalt is. So people on ketogenic diets lose more weight than people on low carb diets. Do you think that's true or false? It is false. <laughs> So when you compare all, you, if, if you restrict calorie to a certain calorie budget and you restrict carbs or you restrict fat or you restrict protein, everybody loses about the same weight. So there's nothing magic about ketosis. It is a, the, the thing that, that is appealing is it helps people who are struggling with sugar addiction. It helps accelerate weight loss. So if you're the kind of person who needs results now, well, you're going to lose per week more weight. But total, you're going to lose about the same. We'll get, we'll get there. Think, write it down or what? <laughs> um, okay, so next question. Are keto diets the best form of diet to improve, improve my blood sugar? False. <laughs> so there are, I mean, you can, you can get uh, equivalent improvements with a good Mediterranean diet, with the Ornish diet, which is like a low-fat, high-carb. It's a high-carb diet where you see improvements in your A1C and blood sugar. Um, so it is, it, is, it is a diet that helps control blood sugars. It is not the only one. So if you leave here thinking, I can't do a ketogenic diet, that doesn't mean don't try a dietary approach to improving your blood sugars. Find another one. Compared to low-carb diets, keto diets are better for controlling hunger and appetite. That's true, yes. They do. It's, and it's statistically significant difference. People who are doing low-carb diets struggle more with feeling hungry all day long and having a more voracious appetite. Okay. MCT oil. Anybody know about MCT oil? So will it help me transition into ketosis faster is the first part. You think that's true? It is true. It actually does that. So you will start urinating ketones at a faster rate um, if you combine initiating your ketogenic diet with an MCT oil. And the dosage range is like 4 milligrams to so about 14 milligrams. Um, it's really nasty stuff. So you're going to pay... You're going to pay probably 30 bucks for it. It's gross. Um, but you'll go into ketosis faster, faster. Does it reduce the amount of symptoms in the flu state of the transition into ketosis? Yeah, yeah that's right. There's, it doesn't, there's no evidence that it actually reduces symptoms. Um, are ketogenic diets better for my metabolism than low-carb diets? So if I do a low-carb diet and, and lose weight, am I going to have a lower metabolism than if I did the ketogenic diet? 
So does one damage your metabolism more than the other? Yeah, it's it's false. It it, it, it one of the proponents of it, or one of the one of the people promoting it, it was was talking about how all these other diets damage your metabolism and and ke the ketogenic diet doesn't. If you do a ketogenic diet, diet the, the, the operating um, component for not damaging your metabolism is the protein. So if you're doing a ketogenic diet that is low in protein and super high in fat, it's probably not, it's, it's going to have the same effect on your metabolism as any other kind of diet. So it doesn't really have a benef that benefit. Okay, so that's the end of the quiz. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, raise your hand and we'll come out to you. Hi, my question is, when you say comparing keto with low carb, I'm confused because I think keto is low carb. So what's the distinction? Sure. So what's the difference between a ketogenic diet and a low carb diet? So it, if you're, the, one of the first slides, it talked about 50 grams of carb a day. So a ketogenic diet is a subset of a low carb diet. Ketogenic diets are so low in carbohydrate, they're considered very low carbohydrate diets. <laughs> And so that the distinction is that cal is that percentage of calorie per day. So if you're doing 50 grams or below, you're probably in a ketogenic range. A low carb diet is anywhere between 100 to 150 grams of carb a day. And so those so people who do low carb diets will be able to eat grains. They can have a piece of bread, whole grain. They can have some potato. They can you know they're it's a little bit more liberal, um, and you avoid the side effects of going into ketosis. Um, and um, you know the the downside is is the weight loss is the rate of weight loss is a little bit slower, but you still get the same point at the at the end of it. I missed whether um, the ketogenic diet raises your blood fats and cholesterol. The answer is it depends on the fat type of fat. So um, if you're doing a very high saturated fat diet, it can elevate your cholesterol profile. Most of the time, the cholesterol profile goes down because you're balancing it out with enough of your vegetable non-unsaturated fats. So, yeah, it, it goes both, the answer is it will go, it can go both directions, but if you're doing it right, um, the, meaning like not the, At, not the Atkins diet, um, it should go down. Hi, so I've been doing the ketogenic diet for 21 months, and I've also cooked hundreds of patients on it as well. You're talking about weight in pounds on a scale. What I've noticed personally is that the weight will plateau at some point, but if they're doing measurements on different parts of their body, they continue to get smaller and smaller over time because they're burning through their own body fat. So like we don't coach to go just based on weight. We coach based on measurements of body fat on your body, just simply with a tape measure. And that's how we gauge success because when you go just by weight, people can get very discouraged when they hit their plateau. I've been at a plateau for 19 months, but I track my measurements for a long time and continue to get smaller and smaller, reversed my arthritis, all of these things, because it's all tied to inflammation. It's a great way to, um, yeah, I mean, the, so the weight number is, is kind of, for me, one of the most unimportant outcome or endpoints. And um, so that, that's a really good point. So she's talking about, like, body composition, and um, it is, it is it, it's hard in a clinical setting to, for us to do that, um, 
with all of our patients, but we do impedance scales and that sort of thing to kind of gauge where um, um, people's lean muscle mass and their total body fat, how the, it's changing. And you will see that. You'll see improvement in their lean muscle mass and a decline in their uh, percent body fat, um, which is a better indicator of health than things like weight and BMI. We use weight and BMI because it's easy. But yeah, that's a good point. Raise your hand if you have questions. Uh, thank you very much for a, a very informative talk. Um, I have been inadvertently on the same kind of a restricted diet now for a couple of years. Yeah. I didn't know what, what it was called. But 95% uh, of it is pretty consistent with the way that I've been eating, except for um, I drink more wine than, than uh, you say. Uh, so my question is, how do you measure or how do I tell if I am in ketosis or not? There, you know, there's over the counter, you can, you can, there's a urine test you can do that you can, it's, you can get it at like Walgreens or Long's. Um, and it, if you're, if you're urinating ketones, you're in ketosis. Um, it's, ex, it, it's an expense I don't really recommend everybody do. Um, because frankly, if you are, are, as long as you're happy, if you are, aren't in ketosis, it's okay, like you know, it, it, it's it's not a th it's not a thing that it, as long as your health is moving in the right direction, you're getting the outcome you want. Um, you know, I don't think it's really that important to monitor that, but you you can. Uh, you know, we don't we don't in our clinic when we start someone on one of these protocols, we 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 do use their initial weight loss as a, a way to kind of decide whether they are actually in ketosis. And we use their food logs um, because you can see, you know, the content of their diet, whether they're in ketosis. Um, if somebody's losing three pounds a week initially on these diets, you know that they're diuresing. They're also, so they're losing weight, but they're also mobilizing water. And um, so you can kind of tell that way. You've, you've been on this diet so long that you're not in that stage anymore. So if you wanted, if it was just a curiosity and you wanted to find out, you could do, you know, you could just do one of those over-the-counter uh, urine tests. They would tell you. Okay, we have a question here. Um, it's actually a, a two-fold question. So um, I know that, that she told us that's against the rules. <laughs> okay, okay. So my first question is, um, when you see patients long-term. Um, what is the success rate of the patients maintaining their diet over 9 to 12 to 16 months? Sure. So our, you know, our success rate really, it, um, if you look at the patients who do, um, I guess this falls into three buckets. Okay, so we have patients who don't do ketogenic diets, who do more like meal planning, and they learn about how to balance their nutrition long term. Um, they tend to do um, the best when it comes to weight maintenance. And then we have patients who do like a ketogenic protocol where it's kind of regimented. Um, and um, when they stop the when they stay in their protocol, they do great. And then, and then when they stop the protocol and they don't um, transition into some type of long-term meal plan, within six months, they've regained the weight, almost 100%. My second question is, how many of these um, participants actually work with the registered dietitian to ensure that they um, get adequate nutrients along the way? So, um, you, in our program, you're either working with the, the physician directly or the physician plus the dietitian, and we also have psychologists. So, um, most of the patients, as they transition out of their ketogenic diet, are seeing a registered dietitian, and um, because that's that's when that's when the real hard work starts. Um, but um, that's it, it. It does vary, 
but usually, usually when they're in the ketogenic protocol, it's so regimented that um, we don't have them always seeing the dietitian. But as soon as they decide they're going to start introducing a more balanced diet, then they they do need to see the dietitian. Yeah. They're given the option. Yes. Hi. Um, do zero calorie sweeteners have a big effect of either getting you out of ketosis or into ketosis? <sighs> um, they are not going to kick you out of ketosis. Um, and we, you know, a lot of there's a lot of products out there that you can do these pre-manufactured shakes and things. They're full of artificial sweeteners, and they you can you can achieve ketosis with those those products. The problem with those is how it's affecting your microbiome, actually. So your body extracts calories out of the food not just through the gut wall, but cooperation with the bacteria that live in the gut and so that's where I would be concerned about adding a bunch of of artificial sweeteners to to any any type of weight loss I have a question back here has there been any research on any association um, good or bad with the keto diet and certain cancers? It's so, yes, there has, and it's very weak. Like, it, it's like, well, you know, it's like going down, you're in your car, you're driving down the road, and you hit the blinker, the light flashes on the back of your car, and the car turns, right? Was it the blinker that did it, or was it the guy behind the wheel turning the wheel? I mean, that, that's kind of the, how it, with, 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 that, with those research, it's, it's, it's really weak. So was it the ketogenic diet that helped the tumor not grow? It, it's, it, there's not really enough data to really show that. There's just, they, it, there's, there have been small studies that say there's, this possibly could have contributed to, um, but you're not going to put a patient in a, cancer protocol and not give them treatment and just give them a ketogenic diet and tell them, okay, here's your treatment. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a question that may never be answered. Unfortunately, I mean, unfortunately, but I, I would never recommend ketogenic diets as, as a anything, but an add on to, um, approved treatment. Okay. Other questions? Raise your hand. Okay. She's coming to you. Her aisle is winning. Is there anyone on my side? <laughs> wow. Thank you. One of the um, effects of the ketogenic diet is to lower blood pressure. So would you not recommend that for someone who has low blood pressure? So what you do with, so how, the me, what's important is the mechanism. So how, why, does, why do ketogenic diets lower blood pressure initially, like right off the bat, before you even really lose enough weight? It's it, it, because ketones are filtered through the kidneys, so excess ketones are excreted in your urine, right? Um, they also drag salt and water with them when they get excreted, so you are on a diuretic. You're on a diet that acts like a blood pressure pill. It acts like a diuretic. So when I have patients on diuretics and they come in and want to start a keto diet, I stop the diuretics um, because... Otherwise, I'm putting them in at risk for low blood, low blood pressure. And so what we'll do is kind of adjust their medication based on how they respond to the diet. Um, but does, does that kind of answer the question? If you have low blood pressure, what you do is you add salt to your diet, which is not what, you know, I'm sure there's probably a cardiologist out there cringing. But <laughs> you, you, you actually, you need, you know, there's... Um, you can add bouillon to your soup and add salt to your food, um, and it will it'll it'll help you retain enough fluid to where you can maintain your blood pressure. Another question here. Last question. Is there any 
evidence that um, a ketogenic diet being um, high in fat content will alter the uh, microbiome at all? That is a really good question. I, you know, it is, um, I don't know, if, I have not read anything about linking um, those two those two things. But, you know, but when you think about how the biome's altered, it is altered by the food we eat. So if you have someone who has a um, abnormal um, gut flora and you transplant their gut with somebody with a healthy gut flora and that person then eats junk food, their flora goes back to being an abnormal bad flora. So yeah, it's probably, that would be a safe assumption that it is probably affecting your microbiome in some way. But is it is it causing, and you know, I don't have, I have had hundreds of patients on these diets and um, the diet itself um, outside of some constipation really hasn't, I haven't noticed any GI um, distress caused by the diet. You, the things that cause that, that is usually if they're doing some kind of whey protein su supplement, that's maybe not high quality or the artificial sweetener that they're using can, but, but the ketogenic diet, I don't, I, you know, I haven't seen people with, have, have um, gastrointestinal problems. There is a question on that side. Raise your hand. How would you compare a year or two years out, compare the success of bariatric surgery to keto diet or Ornish or any of those other? Well, the Ornish diet is not a weight loss diet. Um, it is, the Ornish diet is kind of a, it's, it's really geared for cardiovascular disease and re reversing heart disease. One of the side benefits is that some, some people lose weight. Some people don't lose weight. Some people gain weight. So it's not really, it, it's kind of a, it's, it's kind of its own niche. It's its own little thing and mainly geared toward cardiovascular health. Um, the ketogenic diets, um, if, if, um, you compare the success long term with any type of diet versus bariatric surgery. Um, you, bariatric surgery is going to have a higher success rate as far as weight loss and weight management management long term. And that's the only parameter I'm I'm, I'm commenting. I mean, it, it, you know, there are other health benefits, but. Um, a, a ketogenic diet is is you're 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 looking at losing close to maybe 10 to 15 percent of your total body weight, um, where with bariatric surgery you're looking more at 30 to 35 percent of your total body weight. So it's kind of like you're comparing two tools for two different jobs. Um, someone who needs to lose 100 pounds, it's going to be a challenge to do on a ketogenic diet. Um, not to say you can't do it, but um, it might not be the right tool for the job. Um, someone whose body mass index, they need to lose 20, 30 pounds, um, you know, a ketogenic diet's a good option. As long as your, your health, you know, is compatible. We have a question in this room. Is there any danger, are there any risks on staying on a ketogenic diet for a long time over years? That is an unanswered question. But, you know, you'd think there would be a paper out there that show uh, mortality or benefit or risk uh, because these diets have been around for over 50 years. Um, the, there's uh, one paper came out um, in the Lancet that is just, I have issues with it, but it did show that um, this was in September. If, if you want to look up the uh, um, the journal, it showed that low carb diets had a higher mortality 
um, than um, normal carb diets long term. 25 year follow up was what this study was based on. And so more people died who were trying to do low carb diets of health, other health issues than people who were doing more of a normal carb diet. A normal carb diet is somewhere around 50 to 55% of your total calories are carbohydrates, whereas a low carb diet is a diet where your carbohydrate intake is less than 40%. So um, there may be something to that, that these diets have some mortality um, um, consequence negative impact, um, but I, that it's kind of an un, unknown right now. Okay, we have a question here. Is there any uh, limits or um, on sugar intake, or is it actually no sugar intake? <laughs> There's always people that are trying to, like, find the edge. <laughs> like, <what? laughs> um, yeah, you know, it... So even in, and so sometimes it can be um, um, a challenge when, like, in a 24-hour period, how do I hit 50 exactly 50 grams of carb? Um, you're um, you're better off, you know, if if whatever you're eating, the serving, you, if you look at the serving and it says total carbohydrates more than more than five grams. Don't touch it. It's not going to work because eventually it's just going to tally up too much. Um, so you just have to, you kind of have to just re really read labels and use a good, use a good uh, calorie counting app. Like, and I don't work for any of these companies, but Lose It or My Fitness Pal, they're they're pretty good. Okay, another oh, a question From, uh, here. From a purely uh, pharmacological point, um, if you're uh, wanting to conquer the side effects of the conversation and take, can you take like stool softeners to with that? You can, so, like, yeah, you, you know, and you can actually, it's it's okay to do things like Benefiber. Um, Benefiber, Miralax, Colace, those kind of things um, will, will mitigate that side effect. As as you go along, I mean, you can add more dietary fiber in. I'm sure that's what you. I'm sure that's what you. You probably noticed is that, you know, after the first month or so, you can kind of add more in. But also, if you're on statin therapy or something, that's okay. If you're on statin therapy and you're having your liver enzymes monitored and you start seeing elevations in your transaminases, I wouldn't do it. Yeah, and I, I think that's pretty much, you know, when, when I've gone to other meetings where they're talking about very low-carb diets and ketogenic diets, um, you know, it's, it's pretty universal. You don't recommend ketogenic diets in people with fatty liver disease, elevated transaminases. Um, it's just you have one liver, you know, don't mess with it to lose weight. Yeah. Okay, we have a question here. Um, do you have any credible, like the Internet and everything is full of, experts do you have any credible like resources or even apps like you said that we could refer to like hot like the how to do I mean you explain like the what but is there anything that you recommend reading um, or? well yeah I mean I I probably there's nothing online that I would really say you know recommend to to my patients that like this is a great resource for keto. Um, I know that there's like the, there's a there's a clinic I think opening up here that's doing it's uh, they're one of the gastrointestinal doctors GI docs here in in on Oahu is doing a clinic I think that that is going to focus on ketogenic diets. Um, Who? <laughs> I can't remember his name. Do you Oh, is it Dr. Lamb or Ona. Mel Ona. Mel Ona. Yeah. Ona. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, that might be a good resource. We, we, you know, you could, you're always welcome to come see us. We do, you know, we can give you information on it. Um, 
But yeah, in general, I, I don't know. I, there's too much liability to, to <laughs> recommend something, you know, online. Um, but there's tons of, you know, there's tons of cookbooks and stuff. Um, it, it's not. I, I would check just you know, check with your primary care doctor or some someone who um, knows your health history before you try and do one of these diets. And then, if they think that it's safe for you to do, just you know, there's there's no magic to it. There's just get you you know you can you you can whatever you can do to get yourself below 50 grams of carb a day. That that's all you need to do. Hi, I have two questions. The first is, as an insulin-dependent diabetic, um, would you consider the ketogenic diet no. a viable? Okay, there you go. So that's, that's, and they, that is very helpful. That's something I omitted, um, and I'm sorry. Type 1 diabetics should not do ketogenic diets. Type 2 insulin-dependent. And type 2 insulin-dependent. And what are your feelings on um, intermittent fasting? I think it's a sneaky way to reduce calories. <laughs> okay, I, think, oh, I have a question here. I have a double chair question. You were mentioning that substitute sweeteners are not so good. Stevia is something I've turned to. Is that good or bad? The other is the ketogenic helping cancer, in my case, breast cancer. It is, would it be helpful? Um, as a treatment of breast cancer? Um, you know, that's, that, I'm not, I can't answer that. <laughs> That is, um, weight loss will help. So, um, you know, in breast cancer, weight loss of any kind can help reduce the chance of recurrence. And, um, but the, the data is so weak on, on cancer. I mean, I, I, one, of the, one of the people I worked with was the one who wanted me to put that in there. But I, I honestly, like, it, I would not put my um, hopes on a ketogenic diet and, and, and as a treatment of my cancer. Yeah. The stevia question, I am, I am uh, open-minded about stevia. I, I, yeah, um, I think, um, you know, that, that uh, sweetener seems to be a little bit more well-tolerated than aspartame and some of those other things. Okay, we have a question here. Hi, I had a question about, so I'm trying to follow the keto diet, and um, I'm looking at some sugar-free, like cough drops, for example. It has zero sugar, but it has sugar alcohol. Oh, uh, that's sugar. Oh. <laughs> it's a, that's sneaky, I know. But um, why do you need cough drops? Oh, no, it's just like a candy replacement. <laughs> You've already failed. <laughs> no, um, yeah, I mean, you know, we I have patients who like like sugar-free Jello and other. I mean, there's 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 ways around it, and um, you know, they'll do things like refrigerate or freeze a protein shake and things like so you can get that like candy. But I honestly like try and get yourself off sugar. Really, really work at that. Are there snacks you would recommend to replace the sugary snack? Greek yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> no fat cottage cheese. Um, I, you know, you know, the for the for the people with sweet tooth, um, you know, this the, it's a good option because you you have time away from that substance. And uh, I've had patients come off of their ketogenic diets and they don't, for, for months, they just don't crave sugar until they go to a birthday party. And then they, <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. Have you had the same experience? Yeah. I think what's happened is after you leave yourself off of sugar, your taste buds ask to be changed. Which is when you eat it, you don't enjoy it anymore. It's overwhelming. And when you do eat it, you might 
might get diarrhea. Just because you're getting a pink pimple and blood in the stomach, you don't feel good. It doesn't, that's right. Everyone says it doesn't feel good and it tastes too sweet. And so, um, and that's kind of nice. Like, because that stuff's killing you. Okay, another question here. Just piggybacking on the other. With the Greek yogurt, how about honey on it? <laughs> it's natural sugar. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, if you're gonna, if you're deciding whether you're gonna put your um, Cairo, uh, Cairo um, high fructose corn syrup on your or honey, honey's better. Yeah. But it's not ketogenic. Yeah. Is anyone on the ketogenic diet now and has some tips or want to sh share their experience? No tips? Are you on it? Oh, with no tips. How do you manage not having sugar? <laughs> still working on <laughs> it's, it. Okay. It's, it's hard. It's hard to do. But the, I mean, the, uh, the main take-home point is, if if this diet isn't for you, it doesn't seem to be compatible. You try it and you struggle with it. The the good news is, it works just as well as all the other ones. And so, it, it, there's another approach you can take and try something else. The only thing that doesn't work is not trying. Okay, any last question? Oh, what, 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 like 50 hands went up, okay, hold on. Um, how about lactose in dairy? Uh, I heard that Swiss cheese is better, for example, because there's no lactose, and lactose can be uh, mimicking glucose. It's a real simple sugar, yeah. Um, but it's um, usually you can squeak by underneath that threshold. Um, um, I mean, we don't really get into like this cheese you can't have, this cheese you can't have, um, because it, it's still relatively low um, um, in total sugar. But yeah, it's it's one enzymatic cleavage away from glucose. So yeah, that's a good point. Okay, question on that side. Oh, I just had a comment uh, that my doctor actually pointed me to keto about two years ago, and I lost. He told me to lose weight, so and I did. I wound up losing about sixty pounds. Great. Yeah, it was shocking actually, yeah. because you you do if you do it right, you can lose um, a lot of weight shockingly fast. Right. And it took it was sixty pounds in six months. You know, yeah. 10 pounds, which was huge. I believe that. Yeah, it did. Yeah. And so then I, uh, my goal was to be 200 pounds, and so then I stopped because I had met my goal. And um, but so what I was going to do is have a, just a couple comments. Sure. That maybe you can't because of where you're at. But um, if you're interested, what's nice about uh, being keto is you can measure your ketosis and know exactly whether you're in ketosis or not. But the, the pea sticks really don't do that. If you get a glucometer, I mean a ketometer, that will tell you based on your blood ketones where you're at. And you know that even you might be eating right, but sneaking something in that you don't know of. But your blood will tell you whether you're in or out. So if you're somewhere How between. How much are those? Um, there's a, uh, it's called Keto, keto Mojo. It's about 100 bucks. You okay. can get a whole bunch of sticks. Yeah. It's, um, I think it's about a dollar a test. Usually, they used to be three dollars and five dollars a test, whereas glucose is what thirty cents. So they're more expensive. But if you're serious, I'd recommend it. That way, you know, and you get this feedback on whether you're eating too much or eating improperly, and it'll tell you right off the bat. And you can dial in exactly um, how much food, what kinds of foods, and those type, and how how carb sensitive you are. One last thing was somebody was asking about um, a reference materials. I found most of the stuff on the internet really isn't keto. It's kind of low carb. A lot of the keto meals, uh, no, they're they're not uh, keto. They're they're low carb. There's a difference. 
And when you have the keto meter, you'll know that. Mm -hmm. And you can distinguish in the recipes and the suggestions, and this is, it, it, there's a lot of junk out there. So uh, I don't have a stake in the book, but Keto Clarity is a decent book. It's not written by a doctor. He's just a layman, and he lays a bunch of information out there. You can take it or leave it, but he lays it out it, kind of all in one book. Uh, Keto Clarity is a good one as a, as a reference. And with that, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. We have and a congratulations. That's, in, that's, that's impressive. And it's, it's it, you know, my clinic, we do a lot of different things, and we see patients who've had surgery, and that's the only, the, the ketogenic approach is the only thing that I've, I, I've offered patients where they can lose weight at a similar rate as patients who've actually had bariatric surgery. One little follow-up would be, it worked great for me because I like these foods anyway. I like pizza. I just didn't realize the impact the bread had. Yeah. And so I ate like a two-year-old. I'll scrape off the top, go to Costco, and I ate the toppings off of it and worked fine. Hot right. dog, throw away the bun, it worked right. fine. You know, <laughs> I, I, I like these foods anyway, uh, eggs, dairy, cheese. And so to me, it was, if you're gonna switch to something, that's kind of what I would have switched to anyway. I just, I'm more aware of um, when you're eating a taco, it's, it's the shell that I'm looking at as yeah. an issue versus the other things. But you still oh. have to be careful about the quantity. Yes. In other words, babies are full 100% ketosis. Do they gain weight? Absolutely. So you go ahead and eat too much, and you'll right. still gain weight on ketosis. Right. And so other than that. Thank you. So I heard you say that um, if you have fatty liver disease, you wouldn't recommend this diet. But what if you just, if you have a fatty liver? I'm trying to determine the difference. Okay, so like if, it, if one of them, if, so there is a thing called uh, NASH where there's fatty liver with inflammation versus just a fatty liver. Is that what, is that what you're getting at? Um. I don't know. I don't want to get too personal. No, no, no. Okay. So let's say somebody had, comes in and they have a diagnosis of fatty liver, not, and it doesn't say disease. If it says fatty liver, um, just be, because of that risk, I'm probably going to recommend a low-carb diet because a low-carb diet is less likely to put strain on the liver and you will actually have a chance at improving the fatty liver. Um, the, um, so I'll switch the content of their diet to where they're maybe 35% carb, higher fat, higher protein. And that tends to work. Um, and we do that, so we have bariatric patients who also have fatty liver disease before their surgery, we, we, you know, we can't go in and do surgery with a big liver hanging out over the stomach. The surgeons don't have a good uh, operative field. So we will put them on that, a similar low carb diet like that um, and m watch their transaminases to make sure that they don't rise and um, it shrinks the liver down. So it's out of the way. And so, you know, a low carb option, meaning like a carbs around a hundred gram per day, um, is a good option. So if I just um, have my doctor monitor my labs like regularly, it's, it should be fine. Um, the, key, the ketogenic diet? Yeah. Um, I don't recommend people with liver disease going, to, going on a ketogenic diet. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Question here. Um, just, just two things. Uh, a comment on I've been on the ketogenic diet for two months. Um, I love it, but you have to do your research, and it means a lot of research. It means looking up things and deciding what is the best way to do for you. And one of the reasons I went on it was because I wanted to get away from processed foods. Mm -hmm. That was the big thing. Not so much about weight loss, even though that's a nice side effect of it, but what about all these processed foods? And you don't eat those processed foods when you're on a ketogenic diet, a true ketogenic diet. 
And as the gentleman said, um, over on the other side, I have the meter and I test my ketones. And it's not that you have to test them every single day, mm -hmm. but you do need to test them periodically so you know where you're at. And the other comment is uh, recently, there was a series, there was nine, I believe, one hour sessions, which the title was um, The Truth About Skinny and Keto Diets. Montel Williams was the host, but they had specific specialists from all over the country talking about keto diet and just all avenues of it, what mm -hmm. it does for your brain, what it does for your body. And these were actual folks that didn't say you must do keto, but they gave you a good education on all facets of it. So you can look that up on YouTube and they have all the videos. Great, thank you. Thank you. Last question. Anyone? Oh, come on my side. <laughs> oh, one last one? No. I think we're good. Okay, let's give a round of applause for Dr. Robert Eager from the Queen's Comprehensive Weight Management Program for sharing his na'o this evening. Also want to say mahalo to Courtney Midla, who is out there answering any questions you had in the lobby earlier this evening. And want to say mahalo to Val Milstein, who was providing uh, American Sign Language interpretation. Also want to thank my new colleague, Mina Sugimoto, who is helping with the mics tonight. And, you know, I know some of you have been looking at her going, where have I seen her before? Do I know her? Is she like a third cousin or something? She used to be on the news about seven years ago. So that's, that's your aha moment. Like, that's where I've seen her before. Lisa is uh, like so, my agent. Um, yeah, I'm her agent. She's, if you want to book her, you know, just come see me after this. Um, but we welcome her to Queens, and she's joining us. We're so happy to have her. Uh, next month is American Heart Month. It's February, so we're going to be talking about fixing hearts, literally. And we have not one, but two heart specialists. Um, they're going to be talking about, say, for example, you have a fall or a car accident. You could have a heart trauma that you might not know about. Uh, also, with age, you could have a damaged aortic valve. And are you at risk for that? And what are the symptoms? How are lives saved and hearts repaired? We're going to hear from Peter Sai, uh, Dr. Peter Sai, who is the medical director of cardiothoracic surgery here at Queens, and Dr. Benjamin Plank, who is an interventional cardiologist, also from Queens. They're going to talk about cardiac and thoracic trauma, penetrating and non-penetrating trauma to the chest, injury to heart valves and vessels, injury to aorta and great vessels, aortic valve stenosis, what that is, who can get it, symptoms and treatment options, and transcatheter aortic valve replacement, what that is, how it's done, and who can get that. That's happening Wednesday, February 27th, 2019. I know you know what year that is, but for those folks watching at home, maybe two years from now, going, what? I went on February 27th. Uh, it's going to be free, Queens Medical Center, right here. If you want to register for it, call our Queens referral line at 691-7117, or go online to queens.org and click on classes and events. Val, I'm so sorry, I realize I'm speaking so quickly and you're trying to interpret, fingers are flying. Um, also, if you wanna see any of our past Speaking of Health lectures, just go to our YouTube, go to youtube.com and search for QMC Hawaii. And that's gonna pull up different videos and all of our Speaking of Health lectures. Yes, it does, it has closed captioning. And that's since uh, 2016. So there's Alzheimer's, stroke, uh, cancer, epilepsy, all kinds of um, interesting information. And if you miss something, you just, you know, rewind. <laughs> rewind, I feel like video it again. Okay, and that's going to do it for us this evening. I want to thank you all for coming. Don't forget to get your validations with Aaron outside, and have a good night.